Cheers and happy Sabbath. This is going to be a little bit different of a meeting. We are going to have a testimony from Sister Heidi first, and then we will go into our study. Now, shall we begin with prayer at this time and seek our Heavenly Father's guidance and his blessing in all that we are to discuss and all that we are to hear? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to assemble together, to come before you, to be blessed by testimony, to be blessed by study, by the words of your prophets. Direct us now, Father. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon Sister Heidi and that which she will share with us. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon all that are attending this meeting and all that will see it later. Direct us now. Join with us, we pray. For we ask and we claim that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. And through this technology, we know that we are gathered before you. Guide us now and help us to understand, Father, that that you would have us to know. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, Father, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Sister Heidi, and we are waiting for your testimony. All right. Morning, everyone. Um, as you all know, I was having some eye problems and I went to an option, uh, first a retina specialist who had me believing I had severe allergies and severe infection in my eye, which is highly unlikely and if not poss impossible to have, have an infection just because your eyes are changing drastically. And uh, so to make a long story short, I did find out my eyes are just changing drastically, which is a relief to me. And uh, so it's very unlikely that I'll have to get rid of my cats or anything, which was one of my biggest concerns. However, I'd like to bring it back to a uh, practical application if I can. It's important to keep focused on the principles that God teaches us, not the policies and everything that maybe people try and make us believe or have us believe in this world, um, because our vision can get very blurry and very distorted. But if we stay true to principles, God is more than happy to see us through and help correct our vision so that we can see properly again. Amen. Keep that in mind as you go forward. And I want to thank you all for all your prayers. It was... Nice to know that you were all praying for me. It gave me much comfort. Yeah, and she's got new glasses now that helps her to see clearly. Yes, I was supposed to get them in seven to ten days, but they actually came in two days became, because they came on Life Flight, which is actually an air service that they deliver glasses from other than the courier, which is kind of ironically funny, too, if you think about it, because a lifeline kind of gave me back my... my uh, my world and put things back in perspective for me. So thanks again for all your prayers. Now the sister, the, what, what sister Heidi has just shared is a blessing for all of us, because at this point for her to have an improvement in her physical site is also an example for many of us of how we may have an improvement in our spiritual site. So I thank you, sister, for this, for this opportunity that you've taken to share with us the blessings that you've received this last week. It is indeed powerful. You're welcome. Now, brothers and sisters, 
Last week, we began our message with a quote that I had misattributed. This particular quote is only found twice within the spirit of prophecy. First, we will find it in the book Spiritual Gifts that was originally published in 1858. Spiritual Gifts was then incorporated into the larger book that we would call Early Writings. Now, there are several points from this that I have found very interesting for us at this time. Now, the quote that I quoted from last week that was attributed to Spiritual Gifts, page 152.2, was actually from Spiritual Gifts 155.2. This same quote can be found in Early Writings, page 249.1. Now, for us to put all of this in perspective. In early writings 245.2, which is before you right now, we are given what is called another illustration. There are several sections in both spiritual gifts and early writings, I believe that we could place on two lines to help us understand the times in which we live. Now, this particular section begins with, I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going upon the earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second coming. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn man of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes received the light. Some of these seemed to be very solemn, while others were joyful and enraptured. All who received the light turned their faces toward heaven and glorified God. Though it was shed upon all, some merely came under its influence, but did not heartily receive it. Many will fit, were filled with great wrath. Ministers and people united with the vile and stoutly resisted the light shed by the mighty angel. But all who received it withdrew from the world and were closely united with one another. What angel is she referring to here? This is the first angel. Amen. But it, is it also not interesting that as Mrs. White was writing, she is stating that I was told his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn man of the coming wrath of God. So, does not the first angel have a message very much similar to that of the angel of Revelation 18? Now, now we did cover this, so we, we had gone through this. Not, not that it's not a good idea to go through this again, but just for people who want to go through uh, the studies that we had done on this uh, section in early writings, uh, that was on August 27th, 2022. Uh, that was okay. in our study on the three angels, messages and righteousness by faith. Um, and so one of the things that we, we saw in studying righteousness by faith in the connection with these statements is that all of the angels messages are righteousness by faith. Um, Amen. But the first angel's message contains all three. And uh, so this re repetition of history that we have under Revelation 18 is, is a repetition of the first, second, and third angel's messages. Revelation 18 specifically is the second angel that joins with the third angel. 
again after the repeat of the first angel. But they're all connected. They're all a worldwide message, each one of these, these angels, each one of these messages. All of this is important for us at this time. Is that not what you're saying? Yeah, and we can't just separate out one of the messages and make it the message. No, we cannot. Satan and his angels were busily engaged in seeking to attract the minds of as many as possible from the light. The company who rejected it were left in darkness. I saw the angel of God watching with the deepest interest his professed people to record the character which they developed as the message of heavenly origin was presented to them. And as very many who profess love for Jesus turned from the heavenly message with scorn, with derision, and with hatred, an angel with a parchment in his hand made the shameful record. All heaven was filled with indignation that Jesus should be thus slighted by his professed followers. How is the message of the first angel being rejected today? We can see how this message was rejected in the time of the Millerites. But yet, are we not seeing this message also rejected today? I believe the point had been made that we can look at this numerically that the message of the first angel, this warning to be prepared for Christ's return, is the message of the seven times. So if we are rejecting and choosing to reject that, that leads us to the understanding of Leviticus 25 and 26, and its numerical component of the 2520, our names are being placed in a shameful record. Is this also not what we have seen regarding the message of July 18th? I'm sorry, was that a question? Yes, it was. Can you repeat it, please? <clears throat> if the first angel's message was rejected during the Millerite time frame, and this is indeed a message of the soon return of Christ, and if the premise made that this message numerically can be applied as that of the seven times or the 2520, for our time right now, can we also not apply that the message of July 18th is another representation of this first angel's message to fear God? I'd have to say maybe. Okay. I saw the disappointment of the trusting ones as they did not see their Lord at the expected time. It had been God's purpose to conceal the future and to bring his people to a point of decision. Without the preaching of definite time for the coming of Christ, the work designed of God would not have been accomplished. Satan was leading very many to look far into the future for the great events connected with the judgment and the end of probation. It was necessary that the people be brought to seek earnestly for a present preparation. Do we not see this in regard to the message of July 18th? Somewhat.
As the time passed, those who had not fully received the light of the angel united with those who had despised the message, and they turned upon the disappointed ones with ridicule. Angels mark the situation of Christ's professed followers. The passing of the definite time had tested and proved them, and very many were weighed in the balance and found wanting. Very many were what? Many, many, tekel, eupharsin. Is that not, again, the message that was given of weighed in the balance and found wanting? Right. Is that where we wish to find ourselves today? Um, no. They loudly claimed to be Christians, yet in almost every particular, they had failed to follow Christ. Satan exalted at the state of the professed followers of Jesus. He had them in his snare. He had led the majority to leave the straight path, and they were attempting to climb up to heaven some other way. Angels saw the pure and holy mixed up with the sinners in Zion, and with world-loving hypocrites. They had watched over the true disciples of Jesus, but the corrupt were affecting the holy. Those whose hearts burned with an intense desire to see Jesus were forbidden by their professed brethren to speak of his coming. Angels viewed the scene and sympathized with the remnant who loved the appearing of their Lord. Now, comment from the chat. It is noteworthy that Leviticus 26.1 forbids standing idols, in other words, pillars, as abound in Nashville. I also think of the standing idols being many humans themselves who are erect posturally and worship themselves and refuse to give up sinful lives. That's an interesting comment. Brothers and sisters, are we today to act as individual parties seeking that we are going to evangelize those that do not understand this message? Do we understand yet the message that we are to give? How can we evangelize if we're not fully understanding that which God would have us to say? Here, Mrs. White is clear. This passage of definite time was a test. How do we stand upon that test? Well, according to Mrs. White, you either pass or you fail. There's nothing else. Yeah, you don't curve into this one. So... It's either A or it's F. There's no B, no C, no D. You've either passed this test or you have failed this test. We can proclaim all we want that we are Christians. We can proclaim all we want that we are following this message. We can talk all we want but are we walking the walk? Another mighty angel was commissioned to descend to earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing. And as he came to the earth, he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Then I saw the disappointed ones again raise their eyes to heaven, looking with faith and hope for their Lord's appearing. 
but many seem to remain in a stupid state, as if asleep. And I could see the trace of deep sorrow upon their countenances. The disappointed ones saw from the scripture that they were in the tarrying time, and that they must patiently wait the fulfillment of the vision. The same evidence which led them to look for their Lord in 1843 led them to expect him in 1844. Yet I saw the majority did not possess the energy which marked their faith in 1843. Their disappointment had dampened their faith. Now, can we state that this evidence that led us to look for the destruction of Nashville in 2020 should have been marked by great faith? And have not many been disappointed since this has occurred? As yeah. the people, okay, thank you. As the people of God united in the cry of the second angel, the heavenly host marked with the deep interest the effect of the message. They saw many who bore the name of Christians turn with scorn and derision upon those who had been disappointed. As the words fell from mocking lips, you have not gone up yet, an angel wrote them. Said the angel, they mock God. I was pointed back to a similar sin committed in ancient times. Elijah had been translated to heaven, and his mantle had fallen upon Elisha. Then wicked youth, who had learned from their parents to despise the man of God, followed Elisha and mockingly cried, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. In thus insulting his servant, they insulted God and met their punishment then and there. In like manner, those who have scoffed and mocked at the idea of the saints going up will be visited with the wrath of God and will be made to feel that it is not a light thing to trifle with their maker. Jesus commissioned other angels to fly quickly to revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and to prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move which was soon to be made in heaven. I saw these angels receive great power and light from Jesus and fly quickly to earth to fulfill their commission to aid the second angel in his work. A great light shone upon the people of God as the angels cried, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, come ye out to meet him. Then I saw these disappointed ones rise and in harmony with the second angel proclaim, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The second, excuse me, the light from the angels penetrated the darkness everywhere. Satan and his angels sought to hinder this light from spreading and having its desired effect. Excuse me, having its designed effect. They contend with the angels from heaven, telling them that God had deceived the people. And that with all their light and power, they could not make the world believe that Christ was coming. But notwithstanding, Satan strove to hedge up the way and draw the minds of the people from the light. The angels of God continued their work. Those who received the light appeared very happy. They looked steadfastly toward heaven and longed for the appearing of Jesus. Some were weeping and praying in great distress. Their eyes seemed to be fixed upon themselves, and they dared not look upward. A light from heaven parted the darkness from them, and their eyes, which had been fixed in despair upon themselves, were turned upward. 
while gratitude and holy joy were expressed upon every feature. Jesus and all the angelic host looked with approbation upon the faithful waiting ones. Just as the testimony of Sister, of Sister Heidi this morning was praising God for the way in which her vision has now been improved, are we not to praise God for this light that is coming from heaven through these studies so that our eyes, our spiritual eyes, which had been fixed in despair, upon ourselves that we are now able to turn our eyes heavenward those who rejected and opposed the light of the first angel's message lost the light of the second and could not be benefited by the power and the glory which attended the message Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Jesus turned from them with a frown, for they had slighted and rejected him. Those who received the message were wrapped in a cloud of glory. They greatly feared to offend God and waited and watched and prayed to know his will. I saw Satan and his angels seeking to shut this divine light from the people of God. But as long as the waiting ones cherished the light and kept their eyes raised from earth to Jesus, Satan could have no power to deprive them of its precious rays. The message given from heaven raged and raged Satan and his angels and led those who professed to love Jesus but despised his coming to scorn and deride the faithful trusting ones. But an angel marked every insult, every slight, every wrong, which the children of God received from their professed brethren. Now, we read this last week. The portion from Spiritual Gifts, page 155, is a bit different from that which has been published in early writings. It's interesting to me that these two portions were published 24 years apart. It's also interesting that one very likely would have been edited by James White and one would have been edited again after his passing. Very many raised their voices to cry, behold the bridegroom cometh and left their brethren who did not love the appearing of Jesus and who would not suffer them to dwell upon his second coming. brothers and sisters. Are we not supposed to be warning the world of the second coming and telling others to be prepared? There are many today that give lip service to Christ's return, but are not willing for change to happen in their own lives to be prepared to become the living stones of his temple. I saw Jesus turn his face from those who had rejected and despised his coming, and then he bade angels lead his people out from among the unclean, lest they should be defiled. Those who were obedient to the message stood out free and united. A holy light shone upon them. They renounced the world, sacrificed their earthly interests, 
gave up their earthly treasures and directed their anxious gaze to heaven, expecting to see their loved deliverer. A holy light beamed upon their countenances, telling of the peace and the joy which reigned within. Jesus bade his angels go and strengthen them, for the hour of their trial drew on. I saw that these waiting ones were not yet tried as they must be. They were not free from errors. And I saw the mercy and the goodness of God in sending a mess, a warning to the people of the earth and repeated messages to lead them to a diligent searching of heart and study of scriptures that they may divest themselves of errors which had been handed down from the heathen and the papists. Through these messages, God had been bringing out his people where he can work for them in greater power and where they can keep all his commandments. From the way in which this one paragraph is written, have we yet come to understand how we are to keep the commandments of God. I guess I'm going to have to take silence as that. I'm sorry. Did I miss a question again? I'm sorry. I'm a little distracted here. No problem. What was your question? Well, based on the last sentence, which reads, through these messages, God has been bringing out his people where he can work for them in greater power and where they can keep all his commandments. Taking this last paragraph as a whole, would this mean that we have yet to learn what it means to truly keep the commandments of God? That's the way it's it's, it's reading it sounds oh, like. Ever learning, ever coming to the truth in our case, hopefully. So does that mean that we in the movement today are still needing to learn what the commandments are and how to keep them? Evidently. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are being given an opportunity for ourselves to be prepared to give the message, behold the bridegroom cometh. We are being shown that this final message will be rejected by many, especially many within a church that believes that it will go through. Yet, how can it go through if it is not united in keeping the commandments of God. Well, it won't. Returning to the document that we, we were reading from last week as well. Satan means to take up the minds of every one of us that we shall not be acquainted with what is coming upon the earth, that we shall not know that the day of God's great preparation is upon us. Here Daniel prayed to God, and one of the heavenly angels was sent to him, 
As soon as he caught sight of the glory, he fell helpless to the earth, and the angel touched him to give him strength. Well, there he was. He could just look again at the glory, and there was no more strength in him. Again, the angel touched him that he might hear the words, and yet he could not behold that glory which was presented to him until he came as a man. Our minds have been beclouded through 6,000 years of sin. Our adversary would prefer that our minds were not acquainted with what is yet to come. We are given the opportunity to be able to study. Yet we must decide, are we studying and coming into greater unity, or are we studying and then looking to be more divided? Many would say that they're choosing to study, but they're critical of those within the movement and within the church, there is gossip spread, which is tearing down and tearing at the very body of Christ. We need to be more like Daniel. Because if this is indeed the day of God's great preparation, Are we not seeing, and can we not apply this, as being the heavenly preparation day before that Sabbath of God is soon to break upon us? Today, by our associates, by our life, by our character, we are choosing whom we will have as our king. Heavenly intelligences are seeking to draw us to Christ. Will we respond to their drawing saying, I will follow on to know the Lord, that I may, I may know that his going forth is prepared as the morning, Hosea 6 verse 3. Or will we let all responsibility drop from our shoulders, forgetful that our own souls are hanging in the balance? God would have us fight manfully the battles of the Lord, wrestling for the victory day by day that we may keep the faith once delivered to the saints. The Holy Spirit works with those who will be worked molds those who will be molded, fashions those who will be fashioned. Day by day, we are shaping our destiny for eternal life or for, part, for perdition. As we read this, is this not a powerful direction to us at this time? Yes. Great. Where is our association to be? Are we to be associated and joined with the world? Negative. Or are we to be associated and joined? With Christ. Affirmative. So this first sentence. Today. By our associates. So. Is this something that we can put off until tomorrow? 
Or is this something that should have happened a long time ago? Or is this something that is to be current event, as in today? Right. Um, we live in the day. Should should be, <laughs> exactly. It should, be, it should be day by day. I die daily, right? Exactly. Today, by our associates, by our life, by our character, we are choosing whom we will have as our king. The more we choose to associate with the world, the more our life is impacted. The more the choices we make in our life are being molded. And then our character is being affected. If we choose to live and work as the world does, then our character is being prepared just as it says in scripture, as faggots for the fire. Are we looking that our lives will be nothing more than the kindling of that fire of destruction? Go ahead. Christ has made every provision for the encouragement of his followers. Does that mean we need to wait for his encouragement? Or is that encouragement already before us? It's there for us to ask for and take hold of. Exactly. To all who believe in him, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 12, and 13. Why need the followers of Christ mourn and be discouraged when God has said that he is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him than parents are to give good gifts to their children? Brothers and sisters, there are many that are crying and praying today for sins and issues within the church, within their children. Yet, they wonder why God is not answering their prayers. Where are we to look first? What are we to do when we come before the throne of God? Are we to worry about the sins of others or are we to be worried and concerned about our own sins? Are we not to give up our own sins in order to be an example to others? What's the prayer of Daniel? Where Daniel acknowledged his sins and the sins of the his people. You have to look internal first before you look outside. Agreed. If 
in, in the example <clears throat> where Christ is standing in the temple, you had a Pharisee that came up. And his prayer was lofty. He recounted all the things that he was doing. And his comment, again, was one that he praised God that he was not like. I believe this publican. that came to the temple. Yet this other man was not willing to be so lofty, was not willing to lift up himself. He looked down and his prayer was, be merciful to me, a sinner. Which of these two men went away with his prayer having been heard? Which of these two men went away blessed? The latter. The publican. Right? Exactly. So what we need to be careful about here is because um, Heidi and I have been talking about this and studying this in uh, the fifth testimonies. Right. Is we can't have a pharisaical attitude about not towards those that are Pharisees. If you understand what I'm saying. So yeah. the point is that we need to see this in ourselves. If we see it in other people, that's not very amazing. But uh, the miracle is that we can see this in ourselves. Well, we have a mirror, right? Which is Christ. The mirror is Christ that stands in front of us and reflecting that we're supposed to be the reflecting. But when, we, when we're yeah. not... Um, completely on that path and how can we say that we're <laughs> you know we're saved yeah you know yeah. we can congratulate ourselves that we're not like the church right that's right we can we can look at ourselves and 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 think that we're good because we're not like someone else in this case the the pharisee and the publican we have a pharisee and a publican <clears throat> But well, I mean, if the, publican, if the publican had said, you know, I'm glad I'm not like that Pharisee is, he would be no different than the Pharisee. That's right. We could probably say, I could probably say, uh, I wouldn't trust some of the things coming out of the church, some of the teachings and such, but not not individuals or anything. Everything has to be weighed. Yeah, I mean, we can see yeah. when something is error, but what we what we really need to see is the errors in ourselves. It, it doesn't really help to see the doctrinal errors that others have if we're not able to see the doctrinal errors that we have. To see the hypocrisy that others mm -hmm. have, not see the hypocrisy that we have. Or ourselves included. <laughs> right. That is, we need to see our true spiritual condition. And the only way that we can see that is by comparing it to Christ, not by comparing it to others. Amen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we may do the works of Christ. <clears throat> is this not a great promise to us at this time? If any man lacks wisdom, 
he says again, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, James 1, 5 and 6. That is the only condition. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7, 7. Though we are transgressors of the law of God, if we repent in faith, God can work through us the works of Christ. Key words, repent. The key word is definitely repent. Let all bear in mind that the Lord will not accept half-hearted service. Those who love to do the will of God can do perfect service. Let not the heart that hears the gracious invitation of mercy come, for all things are now ready, Luke 14, 17, still feel to question as to the outcome of the matter, saying, how much shall I have to yield up? You have no arguments on this point. If we follow on to know the Lord, willingly, gladly, we shall know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. Hosea 6.3 If we have decided to obey Christ, we shall respond to his call. If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. <laughs> Matthew 16, 24. What was the issue faced by the rich young ruler? Um, to give up half what he had and give it to the poor and then follow him, right? That was his problem. He was told to give all. Oh, give all. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that would have been a problem. Are we got so to, many responsibilities, right? Uh, well, are we to be one foot in the world and one foot in heaven? Negative. Will Christ accept half-hearted service? Apparently not. Yet those that are willing and love to do the will of God can do perfect service. Too many expect perfection with others when they themselves have no concept of perfect service. They that follow on to know the Lord shall know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. He that is unfaithful in the least will mar his conscience and separate himself from God. Unless he repents even in the least dishonesty, he will go on in this course of action to become unfaithful in much. No one will now plead ignorance for what constitutes sin. All sin, the least to the greatest, is transgression of the law of God. How many times do we hear from others that the Sabbath has been changed? Yet, how many times do those others hold up as being necessary that we should not commit adultery, that we should not covet, that we should not have idols? All sin, without exception is transgression of the law of God. Break them one, you break them all. Exactly. 
we shall have temptations as long as Satan lives. But the Lord Jesus has promised, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. John 6, 37. All who will may come to him for refuge, for strength and for power. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. How little we honor God in doing this. How readily we complain and murmur, as did the children of Israel. We appeal to human beings. Letters come clear across the continent to me and to others for our prayers and our advice and our counsel. <clears throat> How many times? What does that NP mean? Excuse me? What does the NP on your documentation mean? Non-published. Okay, thank you. It's when I when I go through these and I'm looking for things specifically, especially as they relate to the chapters in which we are studying. It's amazing to me how many of these documents were not published before 2015 or had only small portions that had been published. How much these admonitions can mean for us today. Yet again, how many times do we find that we are appealing to human beings, to human wisdom, to understand that which is clearly presented for us within the word of God? There are many times that I have been made aware of those that have said, well, I went to speak with my pastor because I did not understand what God was saying in this verse or in that verse. It happens all the time. Yes, it does. Yet... Are we not shown that if we study the scriptures as our heavenly father has presented for us, that these scriptures will be made clear? Yeah. Yes. Yep. It's truth. I mean, that's what first got me involved with Christianity in the first place. I mean, other than a challenge from my wife. You know, she wanted to go do the, to be married in her church, and the church guy wanted me to study the word. It was, it was listening to his sermons and reading that book that my brain started itching and trying to figure out, well, why would he say that when it says this? Right. So if you read the word, if you read the word, you can learn what God's trying to tell you, especially if you pray about this stuff. Exactly. Comment from the chat refers to James 1 5. Why? Because people should have recourse to God, first of all, <clears throat> and compare scripture with scripture or not go running to their pastors and priests and other advisors. Shouldn't be our first choice. Because, I mean, I've read some of the stuff that has been coming out lately from pastors and elders, and it's absolutely kindergartenish and absolutely disgusting. I mean, they know nothing of the word of God or the spirit of God.
There have been many that have been within this movement, that have now chosen to leave this movement, that have portended themselves as being pastors, leaders, ordained of God. Yet, as we can examine, there are many that would have themselves lifted up. And again, they wish to talk the talk, but in their lives, they are unwilling to show that they are applying this in their own lives as they are advising others to do. We cannot afford to be half-hearted. Either we believe what we say and we live according to that which we present, or we are not fully representing God and we are indeed half-hearted, half of the world, and half of God. If we are half of the world, we are destined to destruction. For there will not be those half converted people that will be part of the kingdom to come. God does not accept half-hearted service. The words of truth, the sayings of our Lord, which are to be voiced by his servants in the churches, cannot be called a new revelation, but as men come near to God, the entrance of the word of God giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple, which means to the humble and to the contrite in heart. If we lift ourselves up, if we say that we are so much more knowledgeable, are we humble? No. Then are we contrite in heart? Repenting of our sins. It doesn't appear that way. What was the message of John the Baptist? Repent of your sins and be baptized. With repentance being the first operative verb. Right. This is the result of opening the eyes to behold wondrous things out of his law. This is the result of having spiritual eyesight. This is why Sister Heidi's testimony today is so very needed by every one of us. Because if we have no spiritual eyesight, how are we going to behold wondrous things out of his law? How can we clearly see that which he would have us to understand? The Lord designs that in his revelation of truth in all ages, the doctrines of grace should be gradually unfolded to the comprehension of men as it is described. If we follow on to know the Lord, we shall know his going forth is prepared as the morning. The treasures of truth are all there in the word but are only seen and comprehended by the searches after the truth from obscurity of dawn in our Lord's teachings to the radiance of noonday. 
We have been fully convinced of this fact during these meetings. How can we find <clears throat> the treasures that are buried in the word of God? Are we not told that we are to approach the word of God as a miner seeking a vein of pure ore? Yes, it's hard work, but we got to dig to expose the gold. Are we able to find this gold by relying on others to tell us where it is? No. No. I mean, they can point to the book. <laughs> right. But, you know, we're the ones that have to dig it out. They can help. They can point. That's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Is we're exactly pointing, pointing things out. Hey, what's that speckle over there? Hey, is that a is that a diamond? <laughs> it's a little one, but it looks like a diamond. Will we ever find these rich veins of go of ore if we are allowing others to direct us? Come dig over here. Individual thing. It has to be an individual thing. The kingdom of heaven in the sense of celestial truth is like a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth the field. That he may come in possession of the treasure. We may in faith and confidence draw nigh to God in every important meeting where souls are to be rescued from customs, from traditions, and errors that are hoary with age. In, seek, in searching the field, in digging for the precious jewels of truth, more coins and concealed jewels should be discovered. Unexpectedly, there is found precious ore that is to be gathered and treasured, but the search is to be continued. <clears throat> now, when she's speaking of coins and concealed jewels, what That's is Miller's dream? There is Miller's dream. How many times are we told? that Mrs. White did not reference this item or that item. Yet uh, they haven't dug. It, or they haven't wanted to dig because just like in Miller's dream, when those came in to view the casket, what did they do? I'm sorry, again, what, what was the question again? Just like in Miller's dream, there were those that came in to view the casket. When Miller is calling them, come and see. What did these people do when they were brought in to view the casket? They started scattering them, throwing them down in the dirt. Covering them with shavings and dirt, right? <clears throat> Right. Shavings and dirt being that which was not of the ore, which was not of the coins, which was not of God, but was of man. Is this the way we are to treat the, the scripture and the admonitions that are given to us today? No, we're to use much sensitivity about this. And as pointed out in the chat, did they also not add fake jewels to 
Yeah, there was the counterfeit as well. Okay. Are we to hold up counterfeit jewels, the counterfeit coin? Only to examine them and then discard them as needed. Yet, how are these counterfeits ultimately discarded? Who does the discarding? Uh, the dirt brush man. That would be Jesus. Exactly. <clears throat> it is by beholding Christ that we are changed from glory to glory. The eye viewing common things needs to be elevated higher and still higher. So can we apply this as did Sister Heidi? That our literal eyesight needs to be improved by looking higher and higher through the eye of faith. Yeah. Good analogy. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, <clears throat> hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity, which is love. Notice she marked out that there was three. Yes. Future reference. First, second, and third angel's message. Right. So <clears throat> would we then apply that the first angel's message is to be that of faith? The second is that of hope? And charity or love is to be shown in accepting the message of the third angel. No one, has, no one has yet the measure of our Heavenly Father's nature or of the character of the Son of God as it is. We must have a knowledge of God by living experience. So is our faith to be dead or is our faith to be living? Living. And if we have a living experience, are we not willing that that living experience permeates every decision that we make whether we know it or not <clears throat> if we are having this living experience are we not coming into a closer relationship with our heavenly father I suppose if you're recognizing it. If we don't recognize it, then to whom are we praying? That guy that jumped in front of uh, the guys that were sitting in front of the, um, the inside the first apartment looking towards the second apartment. Christ already went into. They thought he's the guy that in front of him is uh, was him, but it's not. It was Satan. Right. That's either it. we, either we follow by faith to know where Christ is now, or we are remaining <clears throat> where he used to be, and we are choosing that our prayers 
are ascending no further than the adversary. That's a chilling thought. Okay, from the chat, Psalms 32, verse 8. Why? As it's a promise we should claim. It says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Whenever I hear about God's eyes, I'm thinking of his prophets and those who are teaching the word of God. Here again, we are admonished that we are to have a knowledge of God by living experience. We are not to accept this as being a cold, dead formality. Well, that's the way my father's always did it. It's the way my grandfather did it. That's why I'm going to do it. Our faith is to become a living faith. For do we not serve a living, risen Savior? If we follow on to know the Lord, we shall know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. We are to appreciate the talents of words, faith, hope, and charity. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, these were born not of blood. Proof one. Nor of the will of the flesh. Proof two. Nor of the will of man. Proof three. But are born of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace, John 1, 12 to 14, and verse 16. Will you, my children, receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit daily? Are we going to choose to have such total reliance upon God that we will daily accept the admonition of the Spirit of God? What others may do, what others may say, what others may think of you will not change the thoughts of God toward you. He that doeth the righteousness is righteous. And the opinion of man will not change his character. 1 John 3, 7. You have, my dear children, a heaven before you to win. And Christ gave his own life that you might obtain the heavenly peace and rest and love of Jesus. Only keep thinking unto Jesus who loves you, who is the one you are to love, the one you are to talk about the one who is the author and the finisher of your faith. Edson, Jesus loves you. Emma, Jesus loves you. And the Lord Jesus takes no man's measurement of character for you. You are to behold Jesus and reflect his image in your words, to keep his love in your thoughts. Invite the heavenly guest to abide with you. If we choose not to walk in the Spirit of God, what spirit are we then choosing to walk in accordance with? Well, that other guy, the adversary. 
Is there any concord between Christ and Belial? No. Is there an agreement between Christ and our adversary? Negative. If we are not willing to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit daily, then are we not partaking of the character of the great apostate? That would be an affirmative. How else are we to look at this? This next section begins with an admonition. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. The alternate reading would give us this. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your mercy or your kindness is as a morning cloud. As the early dew, it goeth away. If our mercy, <clears throat> if our kindness is so fleeting, how then are we able to represent the character of the one that gave all for us? We cannot do it. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. Or as the alternate would read, therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, that thy judgments might be as the light that goeth forth. For I have desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Hosea 6, verse 6. What does God desire of us, O oh man? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Are we to be as arrogant as those that believe that, hey, I'm a good person. If there's going to be an afterlife, then I'm going to be there because I'm a good person. From what I understand, if you start thinking like that, then it's done. You're, you're over. You've, you've, you've gone over the precipice. Exactly. When you start thinking like that. God has desired mercy and not sacrifice. <clears throat> he wants people to come to an understanding of his character more than he has desired of burnt offerings. Yet was this understood with the children of Israel? Um. Pretty much not. Was this fully understood at the time of the Millerites? Oh, no. No. Yet, if this is truly written more for our time than for the time in which this was written, is this not written for us today? Well, yeah, that's that's the whole thing. It's it's. It's, we're supposed to be learning from these experiences and trying to overcome those mistakes if we so choose and we, if we so desire to, to try to, um, to, 
to to reflect that character that we want to reflect. I desired mercy and not sacrifice, saith the Lord. <clears throat> the oppression of one widow, the neglect of one father who makes his plea for consideration will be charged against anyone who will do this. God's cause can afford to be just. We need to have eyes anointed with the heavenly eye salve that we may see things on all sides. We have not a one-sided religion, but a complete in Jesus Christ in everything. This faith is to be full. It is to be complete. You are to have the right arm of the gospel cooperating with the left arm, cooperating with the body. We need to have eyes anointed with the heavenly eye set. Is she not telling us here <clears throat> that we cannot afford to be as cold as the church of Laodicea? Because don't we find our heavenly eye salve in the cry for us to accept the heavenly eye salve in the message to the church of Laodicea? Well, yeah, that's the eye salve, right? Where else are we to find it? The scriptures of the spirit of prophecy. I've had the matter presented before me. If anyone is moved by the Spirit of God to publish a book which is adapted to supply a need to advance the truth and the selfish spirits work to bring the book under their control, then the men who conduct these matters have much to learn on this point. God says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. There is a disposition to grasp everything, and to destroy individuality and ignore individual accountability. Yet no compunction has thus far been aroused. A state of things is coming in after the mold of men and not after the Lord's order. When the truth becomes an abiding principle in the soul, then we shall see the words of our prophet fulfilled. Instead of the thorn, the fir tree will spring up instead of the briar, the myrtle. The life's desert will blossom as the rose. Isaiah 55, 13, along with Isaiah 35, 1. We have an individual accountability, an individual responsibility, an individual need to confess our sins, to repent of those sins, and to allow our Heavenly Father, through the dirt brush man, to cleanse our lives. Can our admonition and our duty be made any more clear. For are we not living in the time where we are to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Right. As we come close to the close of our time together today, do we have any other comments or questions? Any other thoughts that we would like to? If you could please send these notes 
you know, please send send these notes because we all need to review them. I failed Thank to do you. that this last week. I'll make sure I get these out this week. Anything else? Shall we then close the meeting with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you as sinners. We come before you as unworthy of your love, your compassion, and your mercy. We ask, Father, today to cleanse us of sin, to direct us to that which we need. Be with us today. Help us to understand that which we need to know. Bless us, we ask. Help us so that we may return again to study more of you and to come to understand your character, your grace, and your loving kindness. Be with us now, we ask, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.